just wanted to thank um, Dominic for inviting me, actually. I mean, this is my first time um, really moving from those seats to this seat, so it's quite a daunting experience for me. Um, but hopefully what I want to do is just uh, talk about, um, summarise um, what has been published in a couple of chapters in this book, which is at the back of the, back of the room, and you can get discounted offers for that. Um, and a workshop that I'm developing at the moment that hopefully I'll be putting on. So if people are interested in coming along to that, there's a form at the back and we'll try and get there. Um, very briefly, what I'm going to try and do is explain and explore leather sex a little bit and what it means for those involved. Um, explore its inner landscape a bit further, so I'll unpack that a bit. And I'm drawing from results from a field research study I did for my MA a few years ago. Um, my lived experiences and my experiences during training in psychosynthesis therapy, and I'll touch on that in a second. I want to outline some suggestions, some possible clinical implications for working with GSRD based on this. Um, note some major parallels that exist between leather sex, psychosynthesis and the therapeutic setting. And propose the importance of psychosexual and psychospiritual education in the training of therapists. Now we've been touching on a lot of this will touch on a lot of comments and, and, and thoughts and conversations that have been going on throughout the day, actually. Why? Well, what happens in leather sex, fundamentally, and I'll go on to what leather sex means, is that one man or men, and again, we're talking about gender here, but this is not just cisgender. Um, one man or men is giving himself and his body over freely for another man or men to control, physically, mentally, and spiritually. Think about that, and I'd like you to hold that as we're going through this, because what that entails is important. And this can either be for a short period of time, sometimes known, in, certainly in the kink world, as, uh, known as a scene, or in some form of mutually agreed ongoing relationship. Um, what I'm suggesting is the interactions, experiences, and dangers, actually, that can occur in such activities seem to parallel the process of self-actualization, which is taught by many training schools today and used in therapy with clients. But in particular, um, a personal sexual and spiritual awakening um, described in transpersonal therapy models such as psychosynthesis. But what I also think it can do is be described as a framework for the actual lived experience of relating with others at either a self-actualized level and or a transpersonal level. So there's a lot of life knowledge and experience that can be shared there. I better go through some definitions really quickly. So psychosynthesis. Who, does everyone know, or has, who hasn't heard of psychosynthesis? Ah, okay, so it's a transpersonal therapeutic training. Um, it was developed by an Italian called Robert Assagioli back in the early 1900s. And it's a unified conception of human development and self-realisation, which is mind-body-spirit integration. It's often called a psychology with a soul. Now, spiritual, we've been touching on spiritual in the last talk, actually. I'm basing my definition here, rather than experiences with specifically religious implications, I'm talking about states of consciousness that give one's life or one's existence a numinous or mystical quality. In rational and scientific terms, the realisation that the conventional sense of self or ego is an illusion. So I'm also looking at transpersonal as experiences in which the sense of identity or self extends beyond or trans the individual or personal, transpersonal to encompass wider aspects of humankind, life, psyche. And it's often talked about as non-ordinary or altered states of consciousness as well. And transcendence, well, experiences and states of consciousness that transcend or are vastly different in terms of quality, intensity and effect from those of normal human awareness. Uh, if anyone knows Maslow's hierarchy of needs, is, they're often called peak experiences. So a quick... Uh, definition of leather sex. It's been around for a while, but it was coined by Joseph Bean, who was a gay author back in the late 90s, although the terms leather sex, leather sexuality, has actually been around earlier than that. Um, and I define it as a specific subculture within gay male communities, but also within the leather scene itself, because it's a uniquely powerful sexual and spiritual bonding between men based on power exchange in intimate situations. And it has multiple meanings for these guys, meanings around a state or a way of being. They often talk about it being a life path, not a lifestyle. And BDSM is often talked about as play or extreme leisure activity, but this is kind of subtly different because it includes varying levels of philosophical, ethical and sexual and spiritual beliefs. And there's distinctions here around education, involvement, experience and commitment to it. 
And as I mentioned before, it now cuts across all gender, sexual and relational diversities. A bit of history for it. It really kind of evolved out of the 1950s and 60s, out of the motorbike clubs that came out of, the world, out of World War II. And it was predominantly gay men emulating a very masculine <coughs> biker culture. But they kind of defined this unique form of masculinity, which integrated this heightened masculine appearance with previously assumed feminine characteristics of care and vulnerability. They eroticized leather and denim. They associated with rough sex. But it was a social network. It was a community, a brotherhood, a family that had a protocol and a moral code that incorporated pretty much all aspects of their lives. The way they dressed, the way they spoke, the way they educated, and actually, more importantly, mentored each other and used fantasy and role play within sex. It paid homage to, um, but also undermined this idea of what manliness is. They wanted to redefine manliness and masculinity the way they wanted to, not the way society wanted to impose on them. So what does it mean for them? Well, actually, it's gender and sexual reaffirmation for a lot of guys. There's a psychological wholeness, a personal authenticity about who they are, what relationships they develop, what different communication dynamics they have. And it, it's really a felt brotherhood, a felt tribal belonging, and a purposeful shift away from this egalitarian equality paradigm that we, that we hear quite a lot of to a much more structured and hierarchical, yet still equal in some ways. But there was this highly, highly moral and ethical stance in terms of the relationality with others because it included the actualization of dominant and submissive identities as part of true self, not just as something we portray. Someone uh, on a website picked it up and I thought it was quite good. A person who wears leather as a fetish is not necessarily a leather person. So there's six emerging themes that came out of the work, and I hope I'm going to get time to do some of the, as much of these. The first was this psychospiritual unfoldment or spiritual awakening that, that occurs for a lot of these guys and the potential traumatic re reactions to it. There was a greater intimacy. We were hearing intimacy being talked about this morning. There's a greater intimacy by the, the transformative way that these guys are present with each other and a psychological equality that goes on within that relationship. Uh, there's an increased sense of self-awareness through actually self-actualizing narrative stories that go on. There was also the danger of inauthenticity, the inauthenticity out in the real world compared to when they're come playing with, 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 with colleagues. This continuum, continuation of a false self-personality. False self but also the key to mentoring and education, a professional moral and social responsibility to provide that to the younger generation. So I'll, I'll, I'll go through some of these themes as much as I can. Um, the first thing that came out was um, a lot of the guys were talking about they had early childhood intimations of something more than just being gay here. Um, and and it's, this tended to burst into a coming out or, or a coming in, as a lot of guys talked about, much later in life, into gay leather sex or into our exploration of domination and submission. But it was as if a deeper sexual identity was always known in them, but it wasn't in their existing consciousness. Not at that moment, anyway. But their gay identity acted as a drive to explore this further. And it led to a kind of a waking up of self. A lot of these guys talk about waking up or initiation rites of passage into something more meaningful and something deeper. Um, the experience is, well, it manifests in a period of intense self-discovery. They found an increasing capacity of questioning, being curious, knowledge gathering, going out and searching and exploring for information being more honest with themselves and being more genuine with others. But it also created a huge emotional upheaval. It was trying to make sense of or not making sense of feelings, thoughts, insights, desires that seemed to just flood into consciousness at this particular point. And it felt like it was uncovering something or someone that had been dormant for years. It was like waking up from a long dream. Now, what I thought, what I realized was this actually mirrored in psychosynthesis the two-stage progression that Asagioli talks about, a journey into self-actualization. And he said this tends to happen at two, ages of our, two uh, age stages of our lives, first in adolescence and second at a, around middle age. Now, I thought this actually compared quite closely to coming out when we're an adolescent and also this coming in process that I talked about later on. But it also mirrored his two stages of spiritual awakening. And he talked about spiritual emergence, which was this process of 
awakening to a level of awareness, level perceiving and functioning beyond normal ego functioning. But also spiritual emergency, this experientially difficult stage where you're having intense experiences and non-ordinary states of consciousness. And so the reactions to this shift can often but not always induce characteristics of psychoneuroses, is anxiety and depression about what you're actually experiencing. And psychotic states and even physical symptoms started appearing. Groff and Groff, who were uh, one of the founders of transpersonal therapy, they said psychospiritual unfoldment, unfoldment results in a profound shift in consciousness that brings about existential dilemmas. Asaji Lioli himself said psychological disturbances experienced during this awakening may present to the objective clinical observation of the therapist the same symptoms as those due to more usual causes, but in reality they have quite another significance and function and need a very different treatment. The second theme was greater intimacy. There was a commonality around this, this, this high, huge shift in the intensity of sexual interaction. Thank you. <laughs> the level of intimacy and ecstasy reached, these guys talked about being way more than vanilla gay sex or vanilla sex generally. It was, they found it to be something unique because it felt like they were accessing parts of themselves which felt like expanding their boundaries of consciousness, expanding their inner landscapes, mm -hmm. their awareness. These were quotes from some leather man who talk about blood running back to parts of my soul that feels numbed. An experience distilled into episodes that focus a lifetime into moments of incredible strength. Surrender creates intense bonding and a strong sense of belonging. A true freedom to be and become that which, that which is one's truest potential. But that deep intimate disclosure and intimate sharing that goes on needs and demands an absolute level of honesty and trust for that interaction to be effective. I think yesterday Doug was talking about honesty and trust as, a, as key to this. And that's really hard to maintain and it's actually the cause of many relational problems that go on, not only in leather sex but actually I think in normal non-leather sex relations as well. But there was something around the honour, respect and dignity of what you're doing with another man and for another man in whatever role you take here. Your reputation is created by your actions and your interactions. There's something deeper going on here and a lot of the guys talk about integrity. And I think that's one word that I think is pretty key here actually. Integrity about how you hold yourself and relate with other people. Tom Magister was a, uh, a leather man in the 50s and he said, look, to be accepted as a leather man meant to be serious. And to be serious meant to be responsible and respected. If another man places his life in your hands, you are responsible for that man's life. If he offers you his life and his mind and his heart, then you're responsible for everything. Everything. If you think about domination and submission here, that's pretty important. Are masters created or are they born that way, he was asked. He says, my experience is they are awakened. Psychological equality. So the, the hierarchical dom-sub-power positions are often seen as kind of patriarchal and controlling or negative or even grooming. But the reality in leather sex is it seems much more of a paternalistic liberation and affirmation. You see that in the roles of leather daddy boy and master-slave relationships. It's power wielded with and received with love, not fear. It's very archetypal roles that are playing here and it kind of presents a paradox to the, the general academic sociological view which insists you can't have equality in relationships with, where power differentials play a, play a part. And yet I'm suggesting the equality is maintained within those hierarchically labelled roles and identities because of that transpersonal connectedness and equality that occurs in the sexual interaction that takes place. Ken Wilber, who's another transpersonal um, psychotherapist and philosopher, he actually talks about these as actualization hierarchies, which are much more inclusive and integrating than uh, dominator hierarchies, which tend to be the sort of standard ones we hear at the moment. But there's also a shift in the meaning of knowing, and this knowing is away from the behaviours and, no and neuroses towards a, a being and a presence and an ontology of the person in front of you, which is a pretty necessary condition, condition of gay leather sex. Um, and it's similar to existentialist Gabriel Marcel talked about this new, deeper psychoanalytic method of being. Rollo May picked up on this as well. Um, 
But there's something around the negotiation that goes on between the guys involved in this kind of a scene, the presence they have in front of each other, that includes some ritual or rite of passage process which takes it over a threshold into a transpersonal connectedness where self, mutual self-actualization occurs from the depth of one's being. I'm going to um, go, actually, through to some clinical implications if we're running out of time. I've just mentioned that the psychospiritual unfoldment and spiritual awakening process that goes on tends, can be traumatic. And I think there's a clear requirement for therapeutic support that affirms that uh, differences in that journey. I think the transferential space that goes on between guys who explore themselves in this way, where the total honesty, openness and trust are the relational links that emerge and transform the way they're present with each other, is something that could be looked at in the therapy room as well. I think this idea about... No, the knowledge of clients and the depths of their being, their desires, their fantasies are still excluded in therapy trainings from what I've experienced. Um, and it makes me wonder whether what therapists discover and know about their clients will be of relevance or consequence to clients and fundamental questions if that's not there. The self-awareness that I mentioned, I think therapeutic spaces and settings can play a crucial, crucial role in this, where we shift from focusing solely on symptoms to facilitating self-actualizing narratives, stories, that generate awareness of my own personal journey. And I think there's a danger of this inauthenticity, this issue around the continuation of survival personalities in the therapy room, because the conflicts between sexual authenticity and an inauthentic social survival out there is, I, is barely acknowledged and facilitated and explored in therapy trainings from what I experienced. And then I think this mentoring and education process, I mean, Keith was talking about elders just a few moments ago, and I think it's, it's vital to have more opportunities and connections with elders here to guide an age-appropriate rite of passage process if they experience this. I also wanted to just bring into, into mind some parallels that I picked up. The negotiation phase that goes on when people talk, about, talk with each other in BDSM and kink I think compares to the initial assessment process in a therapy room. I think that transformative way of being present that leather sex men have compares quite often to the transferential space between a therapist and his client. I think the altered states of consciousness that leather men experience, this top space and subspace that are talked around in BDSM terms, very closely similar to the borderland and hypnagogic states that are reached in therapy sometimes. The role play that goes on, I think it parallels psychodrama very much. And the fantasy and role play and sensory edge play also, I think, matches guided visualisation, imagery work, meditation, lucid dreaming, it's all really close. And the multiple, and char multiple character states that quite often the roles people play and they can shift in and out of, really match subpersonality work in psychosynthesis, I think. So gay leather, leather sex identity, I think, is founded on a spiritual energy that is rooted in sexual identity and experience, but it breaks through the limitations of ego to find aspects of disowned or wounded self that we can reclaim. But the battles are still feelings of shame and guilt. We've talked about that today. The potential for a traumatic emotional upheaval when you realise and experience these things. The problems of lack of integrity, honesty and truth that are, that are around in today's society. And the, and still the splitting of sexuality and spirituality. I think without proper resources and education and support, the dangers, particularly for the younger generation, is really real here. So I think an urgent update of education and information to include these experiential realities of men is really important. It does leave me with two key questions, though. Can one fully integrate all that back into the rest of one's life in a healthy way, or who can one go to to discuss these issues with? <coughs> And I think gay leather sex challenges the therapeutic process and offers up models, offers up a way of being that can accommodate this self-actualizing process and experiences of something more than personal. And I think continuing the repression of this in therapy is damaging and we need to take a serious look at how it could be changed. Thank you, guys. Thank you.